Not that we come here looking for something, although we do. God, often we come here wanting what we want. Often we come here hoping that we'll get something that will keep us going on. Often we come here hoping that the message will be what we want to hear and the songs will be the songs that we like the best and that a certain person will be there and speak to us. And that's all fine, but the most important thing is that you speak to us. The most important thing is that we hear from you this morning. The most important thing is that we lift up the name of Jesus this morning. And God, we, we just need to stop for a moment and repent and ask you to forgive us for putting ourselves above you. We need to ask you to forgive us for wanting our desires above your desires this morning. God, that we've come in with our own, <clears throat> our own mindset and our own agenda and our own preferences rather than asking, what do you want? And so, Lord, we're just coming to you. I'm coming to you anyway, asking you to forgive me for thinking that I know something that you don't know, thinking that I know how things ought to be when really I just need to be humbling myself before you and saying, Lord, what do you want this morning? God, what's on your heart this morning? Jesus, what, what would you want to say to us this morning? And so now I just want to say publicly and in front of this entire congregation that, Lord, that's our prayer. What do you want to say to us this morning? We want to give you complete freedom this morning to say and do whatever you want to say and do this morning. You are Lord and there is no other. You are God and there is no other. And so, Father, as we... David, if we can, just sing this song again. As we sing, bless the Lord, that we would truly put ourselves aside, that we would put ourselves on the cross, our flesh, our desires, that we would let them die and let the life that you offer come alive in us and that we would truly bless your name this morning. We have the freedom to worship you this morning, and so we thank you, God, that we live in a country that we are free to worship you. We don't have to fear, necessarily fear, uh, at, at this point, the government coming in and stopping us from worshiping and lifting up the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And so we thank you, Father. We lift up our country, our nation's leaders, God, that this country would be turned back to you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. That we wouldn't look for help from the government or, or a particular person anymore, but that we would just fix our eyes on you, Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, the finisher of our faith, the one who is our sole provider, the one who died for us and redeemed us and has given us new life. And this morning, God, we just want to worship you and honor you. And we bless your name this morning. We're going we're gonna to take this time to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Um, ask the ushers to come forward. Um, you guys can be seated. Um, we, would, we would ask that if this is your first time at Living Word, Word Church, that you don't give this morning. We don't want you to feel like you need to give anything this morning. If this is your first time here, we want you to receive. And, uh, and we truly mean that. God is our provider. Hello? God is our provider. He'll provide whatever we need. If, if not one person in here gives a penny, but God wants to bless this ministry, he'll find a way to do it. So we don't have to beg, borrow, or steal, or, or guilt people into giving. But we do know that it's an act of worship. And when you give, and when you give the way God says to, he does what he says he'll do. He promises to provide for you. He promises that, that you know, he will take care of you. And so I just want to be blessed. And so we want to give you the opportunity to give this morning. But if this is your first time, please don't give. Just receive this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship in giving this morning of what you've given us, Lord. You have provided everything we have. There's not one thing that we have that didn't come from you including the breath in our bodies, our jobs, and the finances that you've blessed us with. And so this morning, we just want to be obedient to you and give back to you, Lord, what you've asked us to. And then we ask you, Father, to use it for your kingdom, to multiply, multiply this giving, God, and that we would be wise stewards of it, that we would use it the way you intend it to be used for the saving of souls, for the furthering of your kingdom, for the blessing of those that need it the most, God. Lord, that we just want to do what you've called us to do. 
And so we ask your blessings on it this morning. And those that give, let them be blessed and know that you are their daddy and that you love them and you'll take care of them. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Again, welcome to Living Word Church. We are so glad you are here. Um, <clears throat> I want to read a scripture and story to you this morning. And the uh, first thing I want to do is fix something that I messed up last week. Um, I, I've always tried to say that if I say something wrong and I mess it up, I want to I be honest and transparent enough to say, you know what, I messed that up. I need to fix it. And so last week, I messed something up in my message. If you weren't here last week, we talked about um, healthy relationships, and uh, the stage was decorated kind of uh, different. And so you can go online and, and look at, watch those sermons, and uh, it was kind of fun. But it was a good message. But we talked about boundaries, and uh, I mentioned a story about our daughter, and, uh, you know, that the, basically, the story I told was that when somebody's yelling at you on the phone, you say, you know, if you're going to yell, you can yell, but I'm going to hang up and hang up, and then they call back, and then you hang up, and eventually they'll quit yelling at you. Well, she watches all the sermons every, every week. She watches my sermons every week, and Gerald, whoever preaches. And so she called me on that. She said, now everybody thinks I yell. <laughs> and so I didn't intend for it to sound like our daughter was the one doing the yelling. What I meant to say was we had to teach her how to hang up on somebody when they're yelling at you on the phone. And she, she took it really well. But I said, I'll fix it. And so I just want to do that. And that's not a big theological issue. But um, I want to make sure that I always, I don't leave any kind of thing hanging out there that shouldn't be. So uh, maybe you've never heard a preacher apologize before. But I think we should do it more often. So who are you? Who are you? You have a name, right? Everybody's got a name. We're born, our parents gave us a name. And that's who we associate ourselves to be, with our name. Or possibly you say, well, I am a pastor, or I am a machinist, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a, uh, a truck driver, or I'm a, you know, I'm a construction worker, I'm, you know, whatever it is you do, you might label yourself by what you do for a living. And you might say, that's who I am. You might say, well, I'm a mother, or I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a wife. I'm a child, whatever it may be. You might even have some other labels, some things that you've said about yourself or possibly other people have said about you and you've kind of adopted those things that when people ask you who you are, those are the things you talk about. I hope that's not the truth. But I want to share with you a, a story that you've all heard uh, many times, I'm sure. Uh, it comes from Genesis chapter 25 and uh, through 27 and on, on through Genesis we're going to read some of that the story of Jacob and I want to read a little bit of this to you but first thing before we go there I want to I want to tell you the story about Isaac and Rebecca see Rebecca was known to be barren she couldn't have children and then Isaac prayed to the Lord and, and you guys know the story of Isaac you know Abraham had Isaac when he was old and and didn't think they could have children so it's a great story the, the scripture says in chapter 25 that when Rebecca became pregnant with her sons. They jostled each other in the womb. And you can go back and read this for yourself. It says that, that these two boys, while she was pregnant, already started their sibling rivalry in the womb. You talk about sibling rivalry, this is to the max. This is before they even came out. They're fighting. They're wrestling. They're looking for who's going to be dominant even before they come out. Can you imagine this? And she, even though wanted to be pregnant with these boys in chapter 25, it goes to say that she asked the question, why is this happening to me? When not long before she was praying, God, I want to have children. And now she's pregnant and she's going, why is this happening to me? Perhaps you have been in a situation where God wanted to birth something in your life. And there was this conflict going on on the inside of you. And you may have asked that question, why is this happening to me? I remember when, when I was really fighting many, many years ago uh, being called into the ministry. I, did, I didn't want to be in the ministry. I had, you know, every preacher I had ever known, I didn't like them. I just, you know, I had a, a skewed view. Honestly, it was not a correct perception of what real preachers and pastors and, and uh, people of God were about. I just had a, a skewed view of that. 
But I never wanted to be in the ministry. And I remember when God started dealing with me and, and impressing on me the desire to, to be in ministry, to be a, a preacher. And then I fought. I'll just be honest with you. I fought it. It was a battle. Donald will tell you it was a serious battle uh, within me. And it spilled out over on the people that I loved the most. And I remember asking that question. Why is this going on? Why is this happening? But I want to tell you something. If God is trying to birth something in you, there's going to be some pain. There's going to be some jostling. There's going to be some wrestling. There's going to be some conflict. There's going to be some times when you don't understand what's going on. And even in our church where we, you know, we have had some great things happen in this church over the last year, and we feel like, all, many of us feel like the best is yet to come, that we are right on the brink of something amazing happening in this church. And I don't just think it's one thing. I think it's many things all around our church and in our community. I think, honestly, to be a little bit crude, I think we're pregnant. I think we're pregnant with a, a thing that God is trying to birth for us and our community and, and other churches as well. And with that comes struggle and conflict sometimes. And we may be tempted to go, why is this happening? I wish this was not going on. But listen, let's don't resist the tension. Let's embrace the tension and say, this is God at work. This is God at work. Even though it's hard and it's a conflict and we feel some pain, this is God at trying to birth something new. And it's going to be awesome. This baby, this thing that He births is going to be amazing. And so in your personal life, if you've ever felt that or maybe you're feeling like that now, I want you to have some courage and some hope from what this story we learned from this story. Genesis chapter 25. And verse 24 says, When the time came for her to give birth, this is Rebecca, there were twin boy, boys in her womb. And the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Jacob literally means heel grabber. He who grasps the heel. Can you imagine this? You, you ladies that have had children, maybe... Uh, husbands, you've been in there when your children were born. Could you imagine with twins and one comes out and the other one's right behind holding on to the heel? You, can you imagine? Oh, you ain't getting out before me. I, 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 I'm, God, I'm common too. You know, and I, it's, I, I think about our own kids and how they used to fight. I mean, our boys used to fight like, like they hated each other. You just swear they hated each other. And now they're best friends. You know, it's just real weird. So you... Parents that have kids that fight all the time, listen, don't, don't worry about that. Eventually, they will love each other. They will be best friends. Because I'm telling you, our boys fought as much as anybody. And then eventually, when, when they got older, they moved in together. And we were just like, okay, what demon has taken over our boys? Because they would have never moved in together. It was just crazy. So there's hope. Hope for your children. But this was a me first mentality that Jacob had. Me first. I don't want anybody getting anything in front of me. And the fact that he was labeled with this name Jacob, heel grabber, which also meant supplanter or deceiver. Before he was even conscious, basically, of life, he was given a label, deceiver, heel grabber. I wonder what labels you've been given. And so he had this me first mentality. And you see it all through Jacob's life. Everything that he did was trying to be me first. And you know, it's exhausting to live a me first life. It's really hard to live a me first life. You always want the attention. You always want people looking at you. You always want people coming to you. You always want to be the one that's getting the, the, the recognition or, or the, you know, whatever it may be. It's hard. It's exhausting to live a me first life. I understand that. Especially in the world that we live in now because we're inundated with the message that you deserve it. You know, you should do this and you, you deserve this and you need to have this and you need to have a new car and a new truck and, and a new house and better, better you know, vacation home and all this kind of stuff and me, 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 me. We're, we just see it all the time. It's hard to live as a servant, as a child of God in a me first world, isn't it? Let's go on and read some more about Jacob. Verse 29, it says, Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country. 
famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Interesting. Jacob was known, and, and the scripture says that he was a quiet man. And one, one translation, it says he was a peaceful man and that he stayed in the tents. When you think about your children, our kids were totally different, all three of them totally different. And our youngest son was like Esau. He was the one that wanted to be out in the woods all the time. I, I, he, if he could sleep outside, he'd just soon sleep outside, you know. We always believed he was born 100 years too late, you know. He would have done great in the Old West, you know. Or, uh, just be outside hunting all the time. That's who Esau was. And then Jacob was the guy that stayed inside playing video games all the time. You know, watching TV. They didn't have video games or TV back then. But um, I was kind of hoping some of you guys would get that. <laughs> Read your Bibles. They didn't have TVs back then. But he stayed in the tents, it said. He was, he was what we, we would like to label him as a mama's boy, you know. But Esau was a man's man. <laughs> later on in life what happened was it says that Jacob you know, Esau was, was uh, or Isaac I'm sorry Isaac was older it says that Isaac had gotten so old that his eyes were really weak and he couldn't see and he went to Esau and he said Esau I want you to go out and hunt me some game come back and cook it the way I like it so I can eat it and then I'm going to give you my blessing see there were two things that the older child got, the birthright and the blessing, both very important. The blessing was most important from their father. And so let me, let me say to you something, fathers, you need to provide the blessing over your children. Now, we don't live in the culture that they did, and we don't necessarily do things the way they did, but listen, there's great value, men, in you blessing your children and publicly blessing your children, or even if it's at home. And just pray blessings over them. And if they don't want to hear it, just say a quick blessing over them. You know, they'll get over it. <laughs> but bless them. And so Esau went out to hunt some game. Well, what Esau and Isaac didn't know was that Rebekah overheard the conversation. And she loved Jacob. You know, they were both her children, but even the Scripture says that Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And so Rebekah said, Son, I've got a plan. You, I'm gonna, you go out and get a couple of good goats and I'm going to fix them up like your dad likes them and you go in and feed them to him and pretend like you're Esau and he'll give you his blessing. Well, Jacob says, I can't do that. He'll know. I don't have hairy skin. You know, I have smooth skin. I'm not, I don't have hairy like my brother. He'll know and it'll bring a curse on me. She says, let the curse fall on me. Now, all this time, I've read this and I've thought, you know, poor Jacob, you know, he wasn't really in on this and his mama came up with this elaborate plan to put goat skin on his arm and on the back of his neck and all this stuff and trick her own husband, Isaac, you know, into giving the blessing. But what I didn't think about and didn't realize until I really studied it more was Jacob was 76 years old. He was 76 years old, people, at the time. He should have known better, don't you think? I always thought he was just like some young boy. He didn't know better. Mom was trying to talk him into something. He's 76 years old. And besides that, it says that she dressed Jacob in some of Esau's clothes. What is she doing with dressing her boys when they're 70-something years old? I mean, really, can they not dress themselves at 76, 77 years old? I mean, come on. So chapter 27 of Genesis says, that Jacob went into his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, 
The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. So Jacob pulls off this elaborate hoax and gets Isaac's blessing that was intended for Esau. It worked. He got the blessing. He fooled him. It goes on to say, when Esau came back, verse 32 says, his father, asked, his father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. I want to tell you something. When you start thinking about who are you? Who are you really? Jacob didn't know who he was. He had lived his whole life pretending to be somebody else. All these years pretending to be somebody else. And listen, when you pretend to be somebody else for so long, even the people closest to you don't recognize you anymore. Isaac didn't know who he was. Jacob had gotten so good at being somebody else. And Jacob got the blessing. But he had to go on the run. The Scripture goes on to say that Esau decided he was going to kill his brother. And his mother heard about it and said, boy, you better get out of here. Your brother has it in for you. Now imagine Jacob at the same time saying, me, what about you? You know? We like to blame our parents, don't we? Sometimes. Listen, there comes a time when you just got to decide, I'm going to quit pretending to be somebody else. I'm going to be who God made me to be with all the stuff I've got going on, I'm just going to be who I am. I'm not going to blame my parents anymore. I'm not going to blame my children. I'm not going to blame my old boss. I'm not going to blame my wife or my husband. I'm just going to be who God made me to be. And if that's good enough for Him, it ought to be good enough for everybody else. And if it's not, it's their loss. That's just the way I see it. But Jacob had to go on the run, and it says he did. He went on the run. There's a saying that I heard recently that I think is worth the price of admission this morning. If you're going to write anything down, you ought to write this down. God cannot bless who you pretend to be. God cannot bless who you pretend to be. He can't. But He can bless who He made you to be. So Jacob, you guys know the story, and if not, you can go back and read Genesis. He goes, marries uh, his two wives. You know, there's a great story there. Has acquires a bunch of wealth. Um, you know, livestock, servants, all this stuff for many, many years and decides he's going to go back and see Esau. The funny thing about Jacob is, and, and you remember back in that, the verse, verse 18 through 24 when Isaac asked him, how did you get the game so quickly? Jacob said to him, the Lord your God gave me success. I find that really an important part. He says, the Lord your God. He didn't know God. He knew who God was. He'd heard about God. But he didn't have that relationship with him. He said, the Lord your God gave me success. And on and on and on. And Jacob acquired all this wealth, even not really having that relationship with the Lord. He did bless him. But as he's coming back to meet Esau, uh, in chapter 32, we read, it says, Jacob was left alone. He had sent his family on across the river. And it says, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? I find that funny that they wrestled all night and he didn't even know his name. What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and you have overcome and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. He blessed him there. That was the moment that Jacob truly knew 
who God was. He truly understood the power of God. And when you, when you decide, I'm going to surrender to God, I'm going to quit fighting who God made me to be, you'll find out who you really are. And Jacob in that moment found out who he really was. He was no longer Jacob. Suddenly, he's Israel. He's one who contends with God. And, and, and it goes on to say, as Isaac blessed him, those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. And we see that today in the nation of Israel. How God's hand is upon them. And I'm telling you people, if we as a people or we as a nation ever turn our backs on Israel, we are in trouble. And as a church, we ought to support Israel in every way possible. And as we bless them, God will bless us. I'm just, that's just a little mini-sermon there. I'm just telling you. But there's always a conflict of who we are and who we think we're supposed to be, isn't there? There's always a conflict of who we are and who the world thinks we should be. You know, we're not successful enough or success looks this way or that way. You know, as a family or whatever it may be. But Jacob had finally figured out who he was. Luke chapter 9, verse 25 says, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Matthew 16 says, Your soul, how to lose your very soul. What good is it? To gain everything. What good is it to have success in this life if you don't really know who you are? If you really don't understand what your true identity is? And it's time for some of us to just quit pretending and quit putting on the church mask and acting like we got it all together and we're all holy when we're really not on the inside. And that's at the moment, at that moment is when God becomes so real to you, He will truly change you into the person He wants you to be. It, it's just this crazy cycle we go through of trying to be a certain way and trying to do certain things, hoping God will bless us, hoping God will do this, when all along God's just saying, if you'll just be who I made you to be, I'll do what you want to all along. <laughs> but we're so afraid of what people are going to think, aren't we? We're just so afraid of what people are going to think. And what's my boss going to think? And, and I lost a job one time because of my faith. I truly did. But listen, God has taken care of me ever since. He's never failed on a promise of taking care of us. Not one bit. And you don't need to worry about that. But you need to decide, who are you? And who do you belong to? Once and for all, is Jesus really your Lord? Or is He just some good teacher to you? Is He really the one that you go to and say, whatever you want, whatever you say, I'll do it. How would you handle this, Jesus? I'll do it that way. How would you handle the money, Jesus? Okay, I'll do it that way. How would you raise children, Jesus? Okay, I'll raise them that way. How would you be married, Jesus? Okay, I'll do it that way. And that's when you'll find your true identity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. And the new has come. When you truly give your life to Jesus, and I had a, a man come by this week. Um, I want to make sure he's not here, but it's okay, because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I had a man come by this week, uh, one night, Tuesday night, and I was here, it was about 5.30 or so, banging on the front door. And I knew it wasn't anybody from the church, because they would just come in. And I went to the door, and he said, I need you to pray over me. I have voices in my head. And he was just distraught. And thankfully, David came and we both started ministering to this young man. And he had, had, he had grown up in some really, really uh, unusual teaching and uh, just was so confused. And he told me he had read the, Bible, read the Bible for the last several months over and over and over again. And Turns out he was reading a Bible that was really a false Bible. It wasn't even a, a true Bible. Uh, one that another religion had passed on to him. And he was just terribly confused and very upset. Now I've got to be honest with you. My first thought was uh, not, not of him, but you just don't know what to expect when somebody's bang, banging on the door, you know. And, you know, we've heard the horror stories of people coming into churches and shooting people and doing all that, and, you know. I'm just going to admit, I, that was my first thought. Is this guy here to do something to me, you know? And uh, I'm an old guy with a bad back, you know? I don't know how much I can do. Maybe I can kick him and try to run or something. But 
But I realized he was just troubled. He was just confused and hurting. And so David and I shared with him and, and ministered to him. And I, and I just, honestly, for a long time, right, I just think we just laid it out there. I mean, I didn't coddle him. You know, and we talked about that last week. Sometimes you got to let people re- just receive their full consequences of their sin for God to get a hold of them. And this guy had been reaping his sin. And we just laid the gospel out to him and left it with him, you know, and I tried to encourage him. And every time I would say, you know, do you understand the only way is to trust in Jesus? There's no other way, not works, not church attendance, not, not anything else, only to trust in Jesus. He always said, well, I've been doing this. Well, I've been doing that. You know, I've been reading my Bible. I've been, I've been praying. I've been going and doing this. And listen, going and doing is fine, but it won't get you into heaven. There's one way and one way alone, and that's by trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone. There's no other way. And the way I would explain to Him is the way I would explain to you. It's like you're in a plane, and the plane is going to crash. You know this plane is going down and it's going to crash. And your only hope is a parachute. And you take this parachute, and you look at it and you go, Parachute, I believe in you. I believe you can save me. Save me, parachute. That won't do you any good. You can say, Jesus, I believe in you. Now, just hang on a minute. But that won't save you. The Scripture says even the demons believe. But you have to take that parachute and you have to strap it on and jump out of the plane and pull the cord. And trust, trust that the parachute's going to open and it's going to save you. In the same way, that's how you trust Jesus. It's all of me. I'm strapping you on, Jesus, and I'm pulling the cord, and if you come open and save me, I'm trusting you. And if I splat, I splat. But either way, I'm trusting you and nothing else. There's no other way but by trusting in Him. That's it. There is no other way. And your works and your Facebook posts and all those things won't save you. It's only trusting in Him completely and no other way. I've prayed for that young man ever since. But you've got to understand that when Christ has come, the old is gone. Colossians 3.10 says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge of the, in the image of its Creator. Do you know that you're made by the hand of God? That God's handprints, His fingerprints are on you. And many of you, I understand that. You felt like, no, no. God messed up when He made me. He, his fingerprints aren't on me. He's messed up. It's not. You, have you seen me, Mark? I, I, I'm a mess. Listen, you're made in God's image. Don't lie to each other. Don't even lie to yourself. If you take off the old self and you put on the new self, God starts molding you into the perfect creation that He intended you to be. Now, they've got a video that we're going to show. It's, it's about eight minutes long. And some of you may have seen it before, but I really believe that it will be a great encouragement to many of you. You need to understand who you really are. All right, go ahead. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, that we're in essence... So Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. This is God's Word. It says that this is the New Living Translation. Another uh, translation says that you're God's workmanship. I love this that says you're God's masterpiece, that each and every one of you, if you can imagine this, if God had a home, He would have your picture up on the wall. Made just the way He created you to be. And so, in just a moment, we're going to do communion together. We've been a while since we've done communion and Ask the elders to come. Uh, Ron, if you'll come. Donna, if you'll help Ron. Um, Daryl and Eileen. And we offer open communion. For anyone who is a follower of Christ, you're welcome to come. And whether this is your first time here or not, you just take a piece of the bread and dip it in the juice. They're going to play a, another song. This is your time to get real with God. And realize that when you take of this bread and this juice, That's the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was broken and His blood shed for you so that you can be forgiven 
and realize who you really are. And he didn't make junk. And Jesus would not have shed his blood for someone that he didn't think was worthy. And so for some of, the, some of you, you struggle with being worthy or not, that, that maybe God made a mistake. I'm going to tell you something. You're bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ the most precious commodity in the history of the world. There's nothing more valuable than His blood. And He bought you with that blood because He thought you were worthy. So you're free to come. Let me pray. Father, we thank You for this time of uh, sharing communion together, the Lord's Supper. God, we ask You to make it holy, sanctify it. Lord, we ask that at this time we take a moment and we look inward, realizing that You paid the ultimate price for us. You shed your blood for us so that we can be forgiven and set free and that we can have new life in you. And so as we take of this holy communion, God, that we would realize that it was because of your sacrifice, not of anything we've done or will ever do, but we're worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask you to do in this time, God, what only you can do in Jesus' name. You come as you feel led. If you want to pray with someone, there'll be prayer team members up at the front. You can spend time at the altar. Just come. Let God. You'll stand. Let's pray. Father, you are truly the great I am. There is no one like you. And Lord, I know today we have we've suffered through video issues, but it doesn't matter. The message is the same. The message is from your word of who we are and who you are in us. And God, I'm praying for that person today that they like the way it sounds, but it just doesn't make sense on the inside. They don't feel like they're a new creation. They don't feel like they're what you wanted them to be. They feel like a failure. They feel useless and a mistake. Feel like they've done too many things wrong. God, we know that's not from you. We know that's not from you. And so in the name of Jesus, we come against that spirit of depression and darkness and doubt and fear and accusation your word says that satan is the accuser of the brethren that he would love to tell us how bad we are but god your word clearly says that when we are in christ we are a new creation that you shed your blood for us to be free and to put on the garment of christ and that we would think differently and we would be different on the inside that you made us that way and you didn't make junk. And God, that we are made worthy because of the blood of Christ. And that you bought us with that precious price. And Lord, I pray that today you will make that real in every one of us. Make us realize, God, help us to understand that you did not grudgingly shed your blood. You freely gave your life for us. And so that we would be worthy in your sight. Lord, I pray for that person today that doesn't have a relationship with you like that that they would know before the day is done before the sun goes down before they go to bed tonight god that you are real that you love them that you died for them and you want them and you want a relationship with them and they don't need a preacher or anybody else they can come straight to you god boldly to the throne of god knowing that there is grace and mercy and forgiveness to be found in jesus christ we love you we praise you god you're an awesome daddy. And Lord, we commit ourselves to you today as we leave this place, God, that we would be instruments in your hand, that we would be bold to tell people of the awesome things that you have done in our lives and who you are and that you offer yourself freely to everyone with no conditions but just to trust you, God. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. Hug somebody before you get out of here. We'll see you next week. We started a marriage series next week. So we'll see you then. God bless you.